My. Uh, I mean, that's the best part of it. Is the sound effects that that's, Tony that's makes of him chewing time in on a him. Month that the parking lot panties has come up in a JRR. Oh, it's it's you gotta love parking lot panties. <laughs> you gotta love it in the parking fridge lot and save it for morning. <laughs> Damn, it's good stuff. Yeah. It's good stuff. We like it. <laughs> oh, I, I wish I wish I would have been around to party with that son of a bitch. <laughs> or at least, if nothing else, at least have some uh, fresh kielbasa in the morning at his house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> at very least, uh, fuck it. There you go. Is that count as a threesome? I don't know if it counts <laughs> as a threesome, but it's definitely a hell of a tag teaming, pasty. Yes, we love our tag teams. Especially the ones that are overlooked by so many. And the ones that are under panties. I mean, underrated. <laughs> uh, I think we got a really solid list here. Um, we each pick six, and then we shot one of each other's choices in the head. Oh, no! Multiple times, full clip, just... Doo, 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 doo. And then uh, we smash together two lists to make one list, and we have a top ten. Been a while. And Pacey, I think we need to go from the bottom up, ten to one. Oh, I know I'm the I'm the one that wrote it, and I wrote it one to ten. And um, just because I literally wrote it on here this what twenty every minutes time we ago. Do a top so. ten, and I'm <laughs> it. it's all good. Uh, well, I suppose you want to bring it in. I will, uh, I'll bring it in with the team known as Legacy. And that was a team composed of Ted DiBiase Jr. and Cody Rhodes. They were prominent in the WWE. Of course, I mean, why are they an underrated tag team? Well, you got the son of Dusty Rhodes, the son of the Million Dollar Man. Do I need to say more? But I'm finna say more. So you also have the rub of having Randy Orton in their corner at the height of his run. Because Randy, or- Randy Orton was kind of the, uh, he was the Ric Flair of the group. The guy that was kind of the single star while these two went off and did their tag team stuff. We all know what Cody has gone on to do. Huge things. I mean, awesome, amazing stuff. But at the time, it was actually DiBiase who most expected to be the breakout star. Mm-hmm. No, no pun intended, star. <laughs> <laughs> and that's me included. I was really thought that he could be something big. They were two-time tag team champions in WWE. By the time it all crumbled down, Ted ended up leaving wrestling altogether, and Cody ended up in a series of schlocky gimmicks that he oh, made the, the best beer, out plastic of. Mask. Yeah, oh, yeah. So pretty. pretty he, what was that pretty Cody Rhodes? Yeah. yeah. Put bags over everybody in the audience's head near ringside. He he made the best out of all the crap they oh, gave yeah. him. Yeah. And um, but then we all know he went on to help uh, co-found AEW with the Young Bucks and uh, Kenny Omega and Let's Tony not Khan he held the and NWA Championship. For a cup of coffee, he sure yes, as hell did. He did did his daddy proud. He sure did. Uh, next up on the list, Pasty, uh, is a group that maybe a lot of people listening to this have never even heard of, and that group is Chronic. I know Pasty's heard of Chronic. Oh, every day. Chronic consisted of Brian Adams and Brian Clark. Now, in WCW, they were Brian Adams of the NWO and Wrath, but if you knew them from their WWF days... Brian Adams was Demolition Crush, and Brian Clark was, um, oh, not Meltdown. What was he? Um, I I can't think of his name. It It was a nuclear gimmick. Something like Meltdown. Anyways, both just big, badass, uh, underrated wrestlers, in all honest. Two underrated, underappreciated singles wrestlers. They came together, but they came together pasty at a bad time. This was 2000 WCW. Not a good time to do anything. Uh, right. And then after they uh, started getting some momentum, somebody there, bro, thought that they could adopt a APA ripoff gimmick as the company died. 
But in all honesty, they did a decent, albeit watered-down version job of their APA gimmick. They did end up going to WWF when they were bought out, but they were victims of the, uh, quote, kill all WCW talent initiative that Vince had at the time. Of course. Afterwards, they also had success in all Japan winning tag titles from the legends Kiji Muto, known as the Great Muta in the States, and Teo Kai. So they went on to, to good things afterwards. Um, nowadays, neither one is involved in wrestling. That would make sense. Around that time, you were putting a lot of damage on your body. And a name like Demolition Crush, rah, you gotta assume <laughs> they put themselves through hell. Right. Coming in at number eight, we've got the tandem duo of Joey Mercury and Johnny Nitro with their manager, Molina. That's Eminem, for those of you who don't know. Uh, Johnny Nitro. <laughs> You, you you know him as Johnny every other thing you could imagine. <laughs> uh, he tag teams with The Miz now and is your WWE tag team champion. I don't remember which brand. It doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> no, I, I honestly think it does not matter at all. Uh, they were... A great heel tag team. I remember as an adolescent hating them so much. But then there was Melina. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hate Melina. Right. And of course, Jerry, Joey Mercury went on to become Seth Rollins, uh, one of Seth Rollins' security and J&J security with Jamie Noble, who's another very underrated star that I loved from back in the day. It wasn't much more than a character. No, and he also went on to become a, a hell of a producer backstage at WWE for many, many, many years, who may or may not, uh, we'll get into that later also. A couple people, couple people we're talking about right now maybe having bad days ahead. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, <laughs> lot of stuff. But uh, they, they were a solid tag team, and they've been one that is rarely ever recognized but never leaves my mind for long. And so I had to contribute them to this list for that. And their costumes and I, were impeccable. I, I would actually, uh, I would actually add a little hyperbole to that and say not just a solid tag team. I thought they were an amazing tag team, especially with Molina as their manager. Um, which just adds to the case of them being just super underrated. Yes. 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 I suppose I can come in with number seven. They're a tag team that I've rarely seen wrestle on television myself. But as a young lad playing WWF No Mercy with my best friend, we often team together as the tag team of the Headbangers, Thrash and Mosh. And uh, I think for the just for the fact that they have transcended and, and remained a part of my lifestyle even though I don't recall watching them wrestle much, I think that's a big thing. They were a good gimmick for the time, but uh, probably doomed by that gimmick at the same time. Oh, they were a super fun gimmick. Uh, I do re remember them. I, I remember them from watching them live, and at the time, I was not into grunge, and I wasn't a big fan of theirs. Going back and watching them, not only was their gimmick uh, very unique for th for the time period, outside of like ECW and the Independence, mm. there was nobody in WWF or WCW doing that kind of stuff. But their work was super solid. They were uh, tag team champions one time, and they actually, after leaving WWF in the kind of bastardized NWA that was still left around after WCW kind of kicked both their knees out of them, won the NWA tag team champions uh, championships as well. Other, as well as many other independent championships. So it's uh, it's cool. And you had mentioned before we started that I had forgot they made that uh, reappearance back in 2000, uh, 2016. Yeah, there you go. Just kind of out of nowhere in a, a, in a tag team championship tournament. They lost in the first round, but it was cool to see them. Like, yep. I, I, had, I had thought for a minute maybe they were back for a run. No, that didn't last. <laughs> 
But it was good to see him again. It was Dream it was match great. Of mine would be them in their prime versus the Briscoes now. You know what? I I think that would be a really fun match. Yes. Like, the in ring work would be really good, but I think the, the gimmicks and the promos leading up and, and just all around, I think that would be pretty fun. Yeah. And then coming in at number six is a stunning tag team seeing the likes of one Steve Austin and the late Brian Pillman tag teaming together as the Hollywood Blondes in WCW. They're the one non-WWF WWE tag team that I picked. (laughs) Because... Technically, this was a pretty big launching point for old Stone Cold's career. And Brian Pillman, it was a pretty big launching point for his downward spiral. But the rise of his prodigal son. Oh, good. I mean, you just say the names Steve Austin and Brian Pillman, and you're just talking about bona fide Hall of Famers. Now, go back to 1993, and I think a lot of people listening to us, Pacey, don't realize that before Stone Cold Steve Austin had so many knee injuries and then, of course, Owen Hart's uh, breaking of his neck, he was actually a grappler. Yep. Like, he he was a brawler when he became Stone Cold Steve Austin. But back in 93 in NWA, this guy wrestled. Yep, the the brawler end of Stone Cold was completely out of necessity if he wanted to continue doing what he wanted to do. Oh, 100. And you got Brian Pillman, who could not only wrestle but was a high flyer. These guys, they won NWA and WCW Tag Team Championships. They they main evented Clash of Champions, which was the, uh, the free on TV WrestleMania for... NWA at the time. They also joined the uh, stud stable with uh, Colonel Parker, in which um, you've seen people like the uh, Diamond Stud, Diamond Dallas Page, uh, Vinny Vegas. For those of you who don't know, Diamond Stud is Razor Ramon. Vinny Vegas is uh, Kevin Nash. They really, these two guys were from what I've heard, I, I've watched or I've listened to the uh, Bruce Pritchard something to wrestle with about Brian Pillman, and it was said that Stone Cold was told he was going on to be a single star and win the um, the U.S. Championship, and then one day Brian Pillman came up to him and said, "Hey, buddy, we got to come up with a finishing move," and he said, "What?" And I think that's where the "what" came from. What? He's like, yeah, for our match tonight, we're teaming, and we're doing house shows together. What? (laughs) And uh, the rest is history. They ended up becoming an amazing tag team. They made the best out of what Stone Cold thought was a bad deal at the beginning. And it has been said not only that Brian Pillman. Steve Austin there, though. He still had to run through the ringmaster. That's true. (laughs) But it's been said that Brian Pillman is one of only a handful of people that Stone Cold trusts. And for those of you who may have noticed, when Stone Cold was wrestling, he always wrestled with a gold chain necklace. And Brian Pillman gave him that gold chain necklace back when they were the Hollywood Blondes and NWA, and he wore it. He probably still wears it today, but he wore it through his whole career, and I'm sure he actually still wears it today. And he has said multiple times in multiple interviews, it is his most cherished wrestling item that he owns is a gold chain that Brian Pillman gave him. That is beautiful. I mean, but like you said, nobody talks about him. No. Nope. Very few people ever want to think about Stone Cold before Stone Cold. You know what I mean? And it's it's hard to blame them. Kind of, except for Stunning Steve Austin was really, really awesome. Uh, remember back in um, the Dangerous Alliance, um, it was him, Polly Dangerously ran it, Paul Heyman, uh. Uh, um, Barry Windham was in it. Uh, oh, uh, Medusa was in it. 
a handful of other people I can't think of, but yeah, he was part of the 